Um, so I'm Michelle, if you haven't met me before, and I'm one of the PDUI 1 pharmacy residents. Um, so shifting gears a little from pediatrics, now I'm going to talk about adults. Um, and we're going to talk about management of hyperglycemia, so just overall um, insulin management for patients that have diabetes. Um, and then we'll talk about DKA management, um, and then we'll finish off with um, hyperkalemia management. And so kind of the way that insulin fits into all three of the different disease states. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I hope that you'll understand the different types of insulin that we have um, in different, each of the different settings that we would use each type, um, and then a, a how to apply that to each of the three different protocols that we have for um, diabetes management, DKA, and hyperkalemia. And then for each one, how to properly prepare and administer the insulin and each of the different um, treatment options that we have and then to compare and contrast um, the different protocols for insulin infusions for each of them um, and how to monitor the blood glucose levels and how it differs for each. So first we'll start off with the glycemic management in adult acute care patients. So this is how we manage just the general diabetic patient when they're in the ED before they transition up to the floor. So um, just some background, we'll go over the four basic types of insulin first. So we have rapid acting, regular, intermediate, and long acting insulin. So our rapid acting that we use here at UVA is um, Humalog, so that's an insulin-less pro. Um, and this is the quickest acting, so you'll see um, its effects in about 15 minutes, and it's also the quickest off, so it will only last about two to four hours. Um, all of our insulin concentration is 100 units per ml, um, and this one is given subcutaneous. So this one, we would never use this in an insulin infusion. We would only use regular insulin in that setting. Um, and we do keep this in the PIXIS and the emergency department. Um, so then the next, the next longer acting is still short acting. So it's about, it takes about 30 minutes to start working and that's our regular insulin. And this lasts about three to six hours. So a little bit longer than Lispro, but still not very long. Um, and this one's also 100 units per ml, and we keep this in the PIXIS as well. Um, so this is the type of insulin that you'll see for insulin infusions, and meal, it could be used for mealtime insulin, um, as well as Lispro as well. Um, so then moving up a little more, we have NPH. So this one takes about two to four hours to start working, but it lasts longer. So this, one this should cover the patient for about a half to three quarters of the day. Um, so you may see orders for this as twice daily dosing. Um, and this one's also subcutaneous and also 100 units per ml. And this one's not kept in the PIXIS in the emergency department, so you can, if this is ordered for a patient, it would come up from the IV room as an already measured up dose for you. And then our longest acting insulin that we use is insulin glargine. So we have Lantus here at UVA. And this takes three to four hours to start working. So this is um, used as a basal insulin, so more of the background insulin rather than covering meals or, or spikes in glucose levels. Um, and this one is also not kept in the PIXIS, so it come in a, it already drawn up in the insulin syringe that you see there from the IV room. So my presentation will be a little different than Katie's because I have my cases before we talk about the actual, actual information. Um, and so then you can feel free to guess if you don't know and then we can, we'll talk about the answers afterward. So to start out with the case, this is GH. Um, she's a 54-year-old female who comes into the ED um, and she's diagnosed with pneumonia and waiting to be transferred to the floor. So before she goes up to the unit, we have to manage her diabetes in the emergency department and she has an insulin regimen ordered for her. So this is, these are her insulin orders. Um, so can you guys um, look at these orders and maybe call out what each of the different orders are for? Um, so whether it's basal, bolus, um, or correctional or sliding scale insulin. So this first one, um, it's insulin Lispro and it just says four times with meals and nightly. Um, and then you can see the number of units that are given here at the bottom. So which one is that? Yeah, and then this one is, yes, and then this one would be the basal. 
Um, so that's why if you don't see a specific um, dose ordered, so here, 10 units, but this one doesn't have it, then you can know to look down in the administration instructions and you'll probably see the number of units there. Um, and that's your clue to knowing that that's sliding scale and so on. Um, so the three different types of why we're using insulin. So basal insulin is, like I was saying, the psilis mimics are um, the insulin that's continuously secreted by your pancreas all day. Um, so it doesn't correlate as much to with meals. So this is just to mimic um, the way our pancreas kind of works throughout the day to keep the um, glucose down at a, at a reasonable level. And for this one, we use either the glargine or NPH insulins. Um, and then bolus insulin, so this is important to point out, especially um, in the ED, you may hear the term bolus and think of IV push. Um, so if you hear bolus insulin, um, that's the way that a lot of times it's referred to as basal bolus. Here this means um, just sub-Q, so we wouldn't push um, insulin unless we're doing it with an IV infusion specifically for um, like DKA or hyperkalemia, but not just for the general treatment of diabetes. Um, so for the rest of the presentation, I'll refer to this one as just mealtime insulin. Um, and then the last one, the correctional insulin. So this is um, because sometimes before a patient eats, their glucose may already be high. So this is just to correct for that high level um, in combination with the mealtime insulin to get them back to a regular level. Um, so basal insulin, if you have a type 1 diabetic, um, it's important to know that even if they're not eating, we don't want to hold this because they don't have insulin production of their own. So it's really important that we are still giving them insulin. Um, but in a type 2 diabetic who does have some insulin of their own, um, you'll have to discuss with the LIP for that for like a, on each patient-specific case-by-case basis to know so if they are NPO, whether they are still receiving their basal insulin or not. Um, so sometimes those patients would be managed with a shorter acting insulin. Um, and then the mealtime insulin, something that's different um, in the hospital than patients may be used to outside of the hospital is usually um, that they may give themselves their mealtime insulin and then eat. But here um, we try to have them eat and then give it afterward because if they're sick, they may not be eating as consistently or if their symptoms progress and they start vomiting or say they don't like the food because it's not the food that they're used to eating at home and they don't eat, we prefer to give it to them afterward so that we don't give it to them and then have them not eat and then we would cause hypoglycemia. Um, and then, so with the sliding scale insulin, if we measure their blood glucose before they eat um, and calculate the number of units they're getting, then we can just add that in to their mealtime insulin and give it as one injection rather than giving them two separate injections. So here's a picture of an insulin, a sliding scale order for a patient. And then on the left, you'll see um, the other two charts that are in the hyperglycemia protocol. And that shows the sliding scale um, based on either whether it's Lispro or regular insulin. So based on these orders, can you tell if it's the low, medium, or high dose algorithm? So if you look at, um, if we can look at what the blood glucose level is and then the number of units you're giving, um, that would match up with the, so this is Lispro, because the orders for Lispro, and then um, this is the low dose algorithm. So it's just important to know that the three different dosing, the three different intensity algorithms exist. So then you know that just because you have one patient who has a blood glucose of 205, and if they're receiving, um, say, two units with the low dose protocol, they may, another patient who also has that same blood glucose would receive four units if they have the high dose algorithm. So just knowing that the three different intensities exist um, I think it's important so that if you have two patients who are both on sliding scale and have the same blood glucose, you're aware that they may not necessarily be receiving the same number of insulin, of insulin units. So how often do you think we should test GH's blood glucose level? For every meal? Yeah, so that's a good answer. 
answer. So um, if, if its patient is eating, then we want to check it about 30 minutes before each meal and then also at bedtime. And that's just because the sliding scale um, has an extra administration time for specifically at bedtime. Um, so that's why before each meal and then that fourth time right before bedtime. And then also like Katie was saying, at any time if you're ever feeling like there's a change in their status and you're questioning if they could be hypoglycemic, you can always feel free to go ahead and test. Um, if the patient's not eating um, and they're using Lispro insulin, then we want to check every four hours um, compared to every six hours with regular. And that's just because it lasts, it's shorter acting, so if they're receiving it more often, um, and the glucose lowering peaks quicker, um, so they have more opportunities for hypoglycemia with the shorter acting Lispro than with regular. And so what do you think that GH's target blood glucose level would be? 70 to 110. That's a good, um, a good starting point. So 80 to 180. So when patients are in the hospital, we allow them to run a little bit higher than you may um, have as a goal range for when they're at home. Um, just because illness can cause an increase in blood glucose level and the risks of a patient being slightly hyperglycemic are much lower than the risk of them being hypoglycemic. Um, so this range is what we're comfortable with for hospitalized patients. Um, and so hypoglycemia is, we define it as less than 70, and then a critical value would be less than 40 or greater than 400. So we test GH's blood glucose and it comes back at 59. So what do you think we should do? So the patient may not have signs of hypoglycemia, but if say her blood glucose was 59, you may see, if she did have symptoms, it could, you could see sweating, shaking, um, she could have difficulty concentrating or feel lethargic and fatigued, um, and it could be, depending on the severity of hypoglycemia, she could even become unconscious. Um, so the first thing we would, what we would want to do, as long as we're not delaying the treatment, like you guys said, to eat, um, we want to just quickly be able to double check the level with a different monitor to make sure that it is in fact a true level. Um, and if it is the less than 40 critical value, then we also would want to notify their LIP as soon as possible so that they can send a venous sample to the lab um, to also check there. But this shouldn't um, hold up our treatment of hypoglycemia with um, trying to increase it with food um, in the meantime. This is just something that we should be able to do really quickly right before that. So in our protocol, we have something called the rule of 15. So that's what we would give a patient 15 grams of carbohydrates every 15 minutes until their blood glucose is greater than 100. So we would give them um, 15 grams and then wait 15 minutes before we check another blood glucose level. Um, if it's still less than 70, then we give them 15 more and then check in 15 minutes. Um, and then we could continue doing this until we get a blood glucose reading that's greater than 100. Um, so you can see there's four options here. These are the PO options. We have glucose tablets, which are in the Pixis, um, four ounces of fruit juice, a regular soda, and a cup of skim milk. So it can be hard sometimes if a patient is hypoglycemic to chew those pretty dry, big glucose tablets. Um, it may be easier for them to drink a liquid. Um, it is important to know that, that there's a reason that it says regular soda and skim milk in the protocol, um, because when someone has fat along with the sugars, the body absorbs it slower and then it will have a slower increase in their blood glucose level. So we really want something with straight sugar and without fat to slow down the absorption. Um, if, it's, if they're having trouble having something PO or um, if you say you just can't find it and you they're hypoglycemic and you need to do something quickly, you always have the option to give dextrose and this is in our Pixis. Um, and so we would give 12.5 grams, which is half of the syringe or vial that you have um, and that's 50% uh, dextrose. Um, so the one vial is 25 grams, it's 50 ml, so if you give 25 ml, then that should be the appropriate dose. And then if you need to repeat, you can use the second half. Um, and so this should be administered as IV push over three to five minutes. Um, and because it's such a thick, viscous liquid, um, this shouldn't be too hard to push slowly. Um, and we do that to avoid extravasation. So um, 
Then if the patient is not able to take PO and they don't have IV access, we don't want to delay treatment of hypoglycemia trying to get access, so we always can use glucagon. And this is a kit that's in the Pixis as well, and it comes with a one milligram vial and a one ml diluent vial that you'll just remove the water from there and you can mix it in and inject it IM. Um, and the most likely um, side effects that you'll see with this are nausea and vomiting. Did you have a question? Sorry, I thought you did. Me? Yeah. No. Okay, you looked like you had a question. <laughs> Um, so these are just examples of orders. So anytime you have a patient who has insulin ordered, you should always make sure that these are ordered along with it. They are in the order set, but in case they're um, forgotten to be checked off, there's something to make sure. Um, so this you'll see your glucagon, the glucose tablets, and dextrose are all in there as PRN orders, should you hopefully not need them. So moving on to case two, um, this is a different patient now. We have AF, and he's a 72-year-old male, and he is being admitted for a heart failure exacerbation. Um, so while he's waiting to be admitted, he needs an insulin infusion started. Um, so do you know um, if a patient was being started on insulin infusion, where you would get that IV bag from and the concentration of the bag? Yeah, so this is something that we don't keep in the Brixis. This is made in the IV room once the order is put in. Um, and our standard concentration is 100 units per 100 ml. So it's easy to remember because it's one to one. So you can think of it as units or mls and it's um, the same number. And these are always made, like we talked about earlier, with regular insulin. Um, and they're put into a normal saline bag and they come with this little red sticker that you've probably seen before. So it's just an easy way to remember that that's the bag. Um, and this is an example of what it would look like in the MAR um, as the rates are being changed and you chart that each hour. Um, this is just what it would look like in the order. Um, so if a patient is being started on an insulin infusion, it's important to know that there's two different protocols. So we have the acute care insulin protocol and then the critical care insulin protocol. And this will be determined based on where they're ultimately going to be admitted. Um, so if they're being admitted to an acute care floor, um, then we would follow the protocol that's here on the left. And the main differences are the initial rate that we start the infusion at and then um, how often we check blood glucose levels. So with the acute care protocol, there should be um, a, an initial rate in the order. Um, and this is something that is sometimes forgotten to be put in the order and the order Epic still lets the order go through. So if you don't see an initial rate um, and it somehow gets through and gets all the way into you, then you make sure you can just go up to the LIP and ask them um, which rate that they would prefer to start it at. And the way that this is different in the critical care protocol is that when you actually will be determining the original rate um, with the protocol. So you can see here, um, we can test their blood glucose and then depending on what the level is, you'll have an insulin bolus that you'll give and then it shows you the initial infusion right here. Um, so in contrast to the acute care protocol, that one we just start as soon as we have one blood glucose level of greater than 150. So then after the initial rate, um, we get into the maintenance rate. So this is also the critical care protocol. Um, you can see that the, this one is separated by 30 milligrams of glucose. So if it decreases or increases, sorry, decreases by more than 30 from the previous level, um, if it stays the same or increases by more than 30, um, you can look on this chart and then based on their level, see um, what we're going to do for a change. So one caveat to this is if you, if the person is on five milligrams an hour and say they fall into this box, um, it says to increase by 100%. So that would lead you to think that we're going to increase by um, five units. But if you look here, um, it's important to know that we're never gonna increase by more than four units an hour. So it's the percentage or a cap of four units. So that patient would get would have their rate increased to only to um, nine units instead of ten, as well as this um, two unit bolus. It's the acute. Which one? There's one that you have to instead of being able to change the rate dose on your own by following it, you have to notify the LIP and ask them if you can change it. Is that the acute care one? Or so that's a whole separate protocol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 
Yeah, and so that, that's a really important differentiation that I was going to point out um, in the next section, the DKA section. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, so for the regular insulin infusions for just um, treating diabetes in a patient, um, the, there are the nurse driven protocols to change the rate on your own. Um, so in the critical care protocol, one of those other differences that I mentioned was how often we check blood glucose levels. So for both, we would like we would want to check them every hour. Um, but if they're on this protocol, if you see three consecutive readings that are between a range of 120 to 150, and you haven't had to change the rate between those three readings, then you can extend your interval out to checking every two hours. Um, but if, any, if at any point you fall outside of that range, then you would return back to the one every one hour checks. And then um, we would know to stop the infusion if a patient becomes hypoglycemic um, or if we're transitioning over to sub-Q insulin, but this most likely um, wouldn't be encountered in the ED. Hopefully they would be up to the floor by then. Um, so I just put this in here just to show you each of the three steps of the protocol, but hopefully you wouldn't be doing that. If they're, they would hopefully be up to the floor by that point. So then this is the acute care protocol. Um, so those main differences that I pointed out were the initial rate, the blood glucose levels, and then the third thing is this one goes by um, changes as 50, where the um, critical care one did changes of 30. So this one would be if it um, changed, if it increased by 50, decreased by 50, or stayed the same. Um, and then this one doesn't have the cap of four units just because there's no increases by percentages here. They're all by units per hour so that that extra detail wouldn't apply to the acute care protocol. Michelle, how was the initial rate uh, done in this one? So this is the initial rate that it should be included in the order. Um, and then that was the one that I was saying can be forgotten from the order and still get through an epic. So then um, if you ever notice that there's not an initial rate there, um, you would just wanna ask the LIP um, to add that in and not use the, we would switch over to the critical care one to um, determine the rate. We would always want it in as an order. Um, so some other things along with the protocol are before we start the insulin infusion, we, want to, we would want to make sure that there is dextrose in, included in our maintenance fluid. Um, and this is just um, because they're continuously receiving insulin, so we don't want them to become hypoglycemic at the same time. So the small amount of dextrose in their maintenance fluid um, will hopefully prevent that. Um, and so that when we prime our line, we want to prime it straight from the insulin bag so that they're receiving the insulin rather than a bunch of saline before um, they receive insulin. Um, and this will be with about 25 mLs, so just enough to fill the line. Um, and then that line will be connected at a Y site onto the, onto the infusion or the maintenance fluid bag um, at the port closest to the patient rather than just directly to the patient. Um, but if we're gonna flush any um, bolus fluid or anything through the line, we would never do it through the insulin line because then they would get a large dose of insulin all at once. We would want to do that um, with a different line or through a maintenance fluid line instead. Um, and then every time you do change the rate or check a blood glucose level, um, we just need to document it in the EPIC flow sheet so we can see the rate changes um, and there's a couple times where you would need a second RN to check, and that is when you initiate um, the infusion, when you change the bag, or when you're handing off care for the end of your shift. So are there any questions about that first protocol before we move on to the DKA protocol? Okay. So this one we have a case. So now this is a 23-year-old female and she's a type one diabetic patient and she comes in with an AccuCheck reading of high um, and she's diagnosed with DKA. So what are some symptoms you may expect to see from this patient? Respirations. Yeah, so that's a good one. So that is because um, patients with DKA are often in a metabolic acidosis state, so their body is compensating trying to breathe off um, extra CO2 as acid. So that's why I see an increased respiratory rate do you guys have any other symptoms that you think of with DK? Yeah, so um, here are some of the main symptoms you could see. So they would have um, an increased thirst and urination, and that could be because, and that's why, what makes them so volume depleted and why fluids are so important. Um, they could be confused, like you said, respiratory rate, um, fatigue, and they could even experience syncope depending on 
um, the severity of the DKA. So when you see orders put in for a patient with DKA, you should see a maintenance fluid, um, the insulin bolus, um, if with the, followed by the infusion with or without dextrose. Um, dextrose may be added in later on, um, as you'll see in more of the presentation, and then um, electrolytes. So um, depending on the specific patient, they may require potassium, phosphate, or sodium bicarb to also be added to their orders. Um, so the main differences, which you pointed out earlier, is um, that this insulin infusion, the rate would not be adjusted. Um, it's only changed based on an order. So each time we check a blood glucose level, we would want to let the LAP know, and if it warrants a rate change, then they would put it in as a new order before it's actually changed. So how should the initial bolus be administered? Um, we give this as a subcutaneous injection. Um, we just, with this, um, there's no bolus, this is just we start the insulin infusion, or is it an IV push? Yes. So this is um, one of the only times that you'll administer insulin as IV rather than subcutaneous. Um, and then, so we'll start off with 10 to 15 units of regular insulin, um, and this will be specified in the order. Um, and it's determined based on the patient's renal function and their weight, um, and it's just different, it's patient specific. Um, and this that you can receive, you can obtain from the Pixis. Um, and then the insulin infusion, which is coming from the IV room via the tube station, will begin at either five or 10 units an hour. And this will also be in the order, and this is determined based on the patient's weight and the insulin requirement that they had prior to admission. Um, so this is also the same type of bag that you would have seen in the previous protocols, that's 100 units per 100 mLs. So you can know that the rate is the same in units and milliliters per hour. Um, so something we look for is that if we don't see a decrease by more than 150 milligrams per deciliter in the first two hours of treatment, um, then that's something that if you notice, you can run that by the LAP and let them know, and then um, the infusion rate should be doubled. So then that would be put in as an order if we were going to proceed and do that. So testing the blood glucose level for DKA should be done every hour. Um, and then, like I was saying, we would tell the LAP and then the um, rate would change with an order. Um, and when you see the level getting close to becoming less than 250, we would want to look for in order to have an addition of D5 added into their maintenance fluid. Um, and this is because when we're giving a patient with DKA insulin, um, we're trying to correct the acidosis. So even if their glucose level is back to a normal range, if their anion gap is still present, then we would want to continue the infusion until that is closed. So then we need to give dextrose along with the insulin to prevent causing hypoglycemia while we're continuing the infusion. So for fluids, our goal in adults would be to give two liters of normal saline within the first hour. Um, but certain patients that we may not do this in are patients that have any type of cardiovascular comorbidity or um, if they have severe renal insufficiency, we may not want to fluid overload them that quickly from the beginning. But for our general patients, giving them two liters in the first two hours would be our goal. And then in the second hour, we would want to continue saline. Um, this, depending on their fluid status, this would either be normal saline or it could be half normal saline. Um, and their rate would be anywhere from 250 to one liter um, per hour, depending on the specific patient and their electrolytes and urine output. And then finally, as I, as I said before, just to pay attention to when that level gets close to 250, to look for an order to add dextrose in. Um, and you can really make a difference if this is something that's forgotten, um, since you're the one who's um, really most closely following insulin or the glucose levels, it's definitely something that you can point out and prevent hypoglycemia. Um, so if this patient um, were to come in and you see um, the, these potassium levels, which one or which there could maybe more than one, which one most concerning? Do you guys agree or anything different? Yes, I like that answer. So the answer is actually B and D. 
So even though these levels look normal or only slightly low, the reason this would worry us is because as we treat DK, their potassium level will, will decrease. So even though A and C look high, hopefully as we start to treat DKA, these will normalize as the potassium goes back into the cells. Um, but for B and D, we have a much higher risk of that patient actually becoming hypokalemic. Um, so this is what we would be most worried about, and those are the patients that would require potassium to be added to their fluid. So there's three main reasons why their potassium would decrease when we start treatment. So first, insulin, um, as you know, we also use that when we treat hyperkalemia, and that's because it drives insulin back into the cells, which is, or sorry, drives potassium back into the cell, um, which is where the majority of the potassium in our bodies is intracellularly, but when we're measuring it, we're measuring what's in the blood. So this pushes it back into the cells where it's supposed to be and decreases our serum potassium. And then also the large, of, the large amount of fluids that they're receiving will dilute the potassium in the blood. And then lastly, they're at an acidotic state when we start, but as we continue through treatment, hopefully their acidosis is um, beginning to resolve and they're moving more toward an alkalotic state, and then that is also something that causes potassium to move back into the cells. So for all three of those reasons, um, hopefully if someone comes in and they appear hyperkalemic, um, once the potassium redistributes, um, hopefully their level will normalize. So potassium levels are really important to monitor as we treat DKA, DKA and they should be monitored every two to four hours. Um, if they do become low, um, or if they even start at normal so that they don't become low, we could have potassium between 20 and 40 milliequivalents per liter added into their maintenance fluid. And then phosphate is another electrolyte that we monitor in these patients. Um, so if it's less than one milligram per deciliter, um, then we would also want to replace this, and we can do this with potassium phosphate. So about a third of their potassium replacement can be replaced with potassium phosphate to simultaneously um, increase both potassium and phosphate at the same time. Um, and if this is required, then we want to also keep a close eye on their calcium and QTC interval, um, because as we replace phosphate, they could become hypocalcemic, which would lead to other issues as well. So kind of just a lot of electrolyte monitoring um, throughout treatment while we're correcting um, their DKA. Um, so then in patients that are acidotic, which you may see often, um, this sodium bicarb is not something that's 100% necessary to give to the patient, but you'll see it being used. Um, so this doesn't correct the underlying cause of the acidosis, it kind of just helps to correct it in the meantime while we're treating the main cause of their DKA and replacing insulin. Um, so if a patient has a pH um, with less than seven, like between 6.9 and seven, um, then you could give 50 MEQs of sodium bicarb, um, or if it's less than 6.9, you may see 100 MEQs given. Um, but like I said, this is, this is um, part of the treatment that um, some people may favor it while others don't, and it's not really something that um, is required to give the patient good care. Um, and this is another thing that could increase risk of hypokalemia because as we're correcting the acidosis and pushing them more toward an alkalonic state, phagotasium will continue to go into the cells. So that's the DKA protocol. Does anyone have any questions about that one for our final hyperkalemia protocol? So our last case, um, this is N.I., and he's an 82-year-old male. Um, so his doctor sent him into the ED because he had a potassium level of 5.6. So what is your main concern if you were to hear that you have a patient coming in who's hyperkalemic? Yeah, so um, EKG would be really important in this patient. Um, so something you may see um, are tall P waves. There could be a prolonged PR interval. Um, and the reason that we're so concerned is because this could lead to life-threatening arrhythmias um, like VFib or VTAC. Um, so our treatment is really important that we start quickly as soon as we realize the patient is hyperkalemic. So we have three main domains of our treatment. So we have membrane, a cardiac membrane stabilization, um, and then redistributing the potassium, and then eliminating the potassium. So the most common agents we use for membrane stabilization is calcium. Um, so we have calcium gluconate and calcium chloride. Um, so you may see that 
the actual amount of elemental calcium included in gluconate is 10% compared to 27% with chloride. Um, but the main reason you may see gluconate used more often is just because there's less chance of extravasation with it, but it is possible with both. Um, so it's important to know that if this were to happen to your patient, um, applying a cold compress is the first thing that, or actually not the first thing. So the first thing we want to do is um, if you still have the needle inserted into their arm, you want to draw back fluid until you see blood. So then if there is any of the calcium, chloride, or gluconate right there left in the tissue, you can remove it and rather than having um, more and more of it be absorbed, causing further extravasation. So then you would want to remove the um, needle and then apply a cold compress. Um, and depending on the severity, if you use an antidote, um, hyaluronidase is the antidote that would um, help to fix with calcium injections. Um, and then in the light of a lot of shortages that we have lately, um, also the protocol, in, so it's not on shortage right now, but the protocol includes um, that you may see calcium gluconate as an IV premixed bag of two grams um, in case the vials are on shortage. Um, this is a possible alternative. Um, and so then also for membrane stabilization, if a patient has digoxin toxicity, and this was um, leading to their hyperkalemia, then we would use magnesium sulfate. Um, and so it's a 50% solution in the vial, um, and we would give one to two grams. So this is a one gram vial, um, but in order to administer it IV rather than IM, and we need to have it be less than 20%. Um, so if we add three milliliters of normal saline or D5, and then that would get us to one gram per five ml, and that would be safe to inject because that would be less than 20%. So the main important, most important thing to remember with this is just be, um, that you have to dilute it before we can give it as IV push. So then the next part is redistributing the potassium. So we want to get the potassium out of the blood and put it back into the cells. So we'll do that, like we were talking about with DKA. Um, we'll use this here to specifically treat the potassium um, with insulin. So we, can, we would start off, um, it would tell you in the order if we were going to start with 5 or 10 units of IV push. Um, and this, is the, if this push um, dose is determined based on um, the patient's renal function. So this is an important thing that um, it would be good for you guys to know. And so if you see an order coming through for 10 units of IV push, but you know that this patient has really poor renal function or is on dialysis, um, maybe the next slide here. Um, this actually, there were a couple studies done that compared 5 units versus 10 units um, in patients with renal dysfunction. So um, here at UVA we did an internal study, so this just looked at all patients who were treated for hyperkalemia. Um, and then of those who had a hypoglycemic event, 44.4% 44 of them um, were on hemodialysis. Compared to those who didn't have a hypoglycemic event, only 9.1% of those patients were on dialysis. Um, so you can see here that there's, out of those patients, the risk factor for having hypoglycemia was um, patients on dialysis. So that shows us that it could be connected to um, their renal function. Um, and that's further supported by this study that was in pharmacotherapy. So they, com con they compared patients who all of them had renal insufficiency and they compared a 5-unit bolus compared to a 10-unit bolus. Um, and both of them actually had the same extent of potassium lowering, um, so they both worked just as well. But hypoglycemia occurred in 9.5% of patients with the 5-unit bolus compared to 28.6% with the 10-unit bolus. So if you know that your patient has poor renal function, um, that can be a really important intervention that you could um, bring up to the provider to maybe switch their initial insulin bolus to five units rather than the 10. I'm just going to go back. Um, so along with their bolus right after, um, we're also going to give a bolus of dextrose. And this is because when we're treating hyperkalemia, um, the patient could have normal blood glucose, so we don't want to cause them to become hypoglycemic while we're treating. So we give that along with dextrose. Um, but if a patient starts off um, already greater than 250 as a blood glucose level, um, then we don't need to give the dextrose right away because we could kill two birds with one stone and treat their hyperkalemia and also decrease their blood glucose to a more acceptable range. Um, so also in our patients that have 
um, that were more concerned for hypoglycemia because they do have renal dysfunction. We can also consider using a 10% dextrose continuous infusion of 50 ml an hour um, just to further make sure that we're controlling and preventing the hypoglycemia um, rather than just the push that we could use in our general patient. So then um, we're going to want to check their blood glucose levels. According to the protocol, um, we would check twice um, every 30 minutes and then after that every hour. Um, but I would recommend checking every 30 minutes actually three times and then every hour um, because if we think about it, we're going to check in the beginning and give insulin um, and then we're giving dextrose right away. So there are, for, after that first 30 minutes, you may actually see an increase because of the dextrose. Um, and then the second time you check, it may be back um, where we, at the level we started at when the insulin starts working. And then that next half hour is where you have the most likelihood of actually seeing them become hypo, uh, hypoglycemic. Um, so it may be a safer option to just check every 30 minutes three times before extending out to one hour. Um, and I forgot to mention, when we draw that um, either five or 10 unit initial bolus, we would wanna put that into our saline flush so that we can inject it um, as 10 mLs rather than, or so that it can be over two to five minutes because that small amount of insulin would be kind of hard to inject over that amount of time. So then the last part of, um, of treating hyperkalemia is, um, oh sorry, I'm actually not the last part yet. So I'll, also to redistribute, um, the most common way that you'll see is with insulin. But there are um, these two other options that are less commonly seen. So there's albuterol and sodium bicarb. Um, and you can see with albuterol that the patient would need to have four to eight nebulizers um, to really be effective and help to decrease the potassium. So that's probably why you won't see it as often. Um, and also the studies are really only showed to be effective when it was used also with insulin, so not just using albuterol on its own instead of insulin. Um, so that's a potential thing that you, that you may see for a patient, but insulin is really the most important part of um, treating hyperkalemia. Um, and then there's also sodium bicarb. Um, so this also is probably not very commonly used, but if you do see it, it would be a 50 MEQ bolus over five minutes. Um, and it should probably, most, it should really be avoided in patients with severe heart failure because of the amount of sodium that they would be getting all at once. Um, and it's also been shown to be less effective in patients with severe renal dysfunction. So then our last part of treating hyperkalemia is actually trying to eliminate the potassium. So at first we stabilized the cardiac membrane and then we redistributed the potassium back into the cells. Um, but then if they, really our total body overloaded with potassium, just putting it in the cells will actually get rid of the potassium from their body. So that's when you may see um, loop diuretics or k or um, hemodialysis is really the best way to get rid of potassium for patients who have severe renal dysfunction or if they do have um, EKG changes with QRS widening. So the diuretics, there's furosemide and Bumex. Um, right now, Bumex is not in the Pixis just because it's unshorted, but furosemide is still in the Pixis. Um, and these would both be given as IV over two to five minutes, and they would be given with fluids. Um, just because when a patient is being diuresed um, with these with loop diuretics, that ca that causes the body to um, waste potassium but we need to give it along with fluid so that they have some fluid to urinate without making them volume depleted. And then K-exalate um, is a potential drug that you may see. Um, it's kind of falling out of favor within the past couple of years because there's some serious um, adverse effects that can go along with it. Um, but if you do see it, it could be either orally or as an enema. Um, and if it's oral, you wanna make sure that you have an order as well to have at the same time with the canceling for either lactulose or Miralax. Um, so this is so that to try and prevent some of these side effects um, that I have here. So when k was approved, it was um, a long time ago. So before the FDA had regulations that drugs needed to be tested as safe and effective before that they were approved. So after it was already on the market, there were some warnings that came out um, that showed GI necrosis or perforation, obstruction, and bleeding. Um, and it could cause ischemic colitis. So that's why it's really important that we give it with a laxative because otherwise um, it can cause um, the bowel to have like cement-like um, 
it can become like a cement in the bowel and then cause all of these complications. So if you have a patient who has any increased risk for these complications at all, so anyone who had surgery, so they have um, the chance of post-op ileus, medications that slow down the bowel, so most of our patients probably are on opiates. Um, if they have critical illness, so they have the potential of um, becoming in shock and then they'll have less blood flow um, to the GI tract. So for all of these reasons, they would have an even higher risk of these side effects. So they're probably not the ideal patients to use this treatment in. And then finally, um, because hyperkalemia is something we need to treat acutely, um, this would be kind of a last line option. So the calcium and insulin are more important to get on board first, just because this takes so long to start working. It can take um, a couple days and the efficacy in some of the more recent studies um, isn't even sure if how well it actually works compared to um, when it was compared to placebo. So those were the three protocols. Um, it was kind of a lot of information at once, so I just um, tried to condense, I think, the most important points into a couple clinical clinical pearl slides. Um, so for the diabetes management protocol, um, I think it's important to know that there's the two different protocols in that um, the one order for the patient will be where they're ultimately being admitted to. Um, and that with the critical care protocol, there's the maximum of four units an hour increase. Um, and then monitoring blood glucose levels every hour to one to two hours, depending on the protocol. Um, the main difference that you pointed out was that we're not going to change the rate for DKA insulin infusions, and that those are only based on an order. Um, and that this is the this is when we would give insulin as an intravenous injection rather than subcutaneous. And then for hyperkalemia, monitoring the EKG. Um, checking a glu blood glucose every 30 minutes three times and then at each hour. Um, the most urgent treatments are the calcium, insulin, and dextrose. Um, and then if K-exalate is ordered, um, to making sure that you have a laxative ordered along with it to prevent some of the severe side effects that we can see. And then lastly, patients with renal dysfunction may require less insulin so they have a higher chance of hypoglycemia. So overall, um, I think it's important to refer back to the protocols because they are similar but also different. So just to make sure um, you're clear as to how you're treating your specific patient at that time. And if you had any questions at all, um, you can always reach out to any of the ED pharmacists and we would be happy to help. Do you have, guys have any questions?